Well, how do there, charms? Does I, Captain of the Steves, and yes, I just downed a cup of tea. Yeah, oh, I've got my front facing lights on. There we go. That's a bit better, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's a lot better, in fact. Right, anyway, I'm going to be doing the Sentinel Pillar Law today, people, because, yes, I've been told that it makes a lot more sense now, especially if you read it in one hit and you read it in order. That said, I'm just going to jump on over into game. You would see I'm at a Sentinel Pillar right now, people. I'll show you my base that I've got here in a moment, because it's pretty darn sweet. Anyway, well, I think it is. I'm going to head on over. I'm just going to read the Sentinel Pillar lore of where I'm at right now, so you know how to access it yourself. So this, this is a Sentinel Pillar. You go over to this doohickey here, interact a Mondo with it. There we go. Warning. Boundary node exposed. And it's in the sort of purpley text. Well, purpley text is usually linked to the void and all that sort of shenanigans sentinel stuff is usually in red so that's rather curious in itself but anyway pressing on boundary archive status vulnerable okay well we're going to be well we want to access the logs we're not bothered about the other stuff however there is quite a kinky weapon in here look at that it's very nice i'll give you the coordinates later anyway let's go back a level let's go back in access logs here we go here we go access logs imposter detected see it's in red that's what I half expect. That's sentinelized stuff. Override code Ariadne, but it's like got a four and a three and a one in there. But as Ariadne, and it's in purple. Again, purple is usually realm of glass type stuff in the void, whereas red is usually sentinels. So curious and curious are still why Ariadne's code is there. She went missing into the void with Ariadne. The imposter, a doppelganger, is on the anomaly. Oh, it's that little song. Captain Steve? Oh, Captain Steve? Captain! Captain! Brilliant tune, this one, people. Anyway, pressing on, I'm getting distracted. Manifesting personality protocol, voice of the hive. The hive. Which is mentioned quite a lot in the singularity, isn't it, really? There we go, let's move on. on. Won't you join us? Won't you sing? Won't you scream? That doesn't sound like the start of a pretty good song to me. That's, that's a bit freaking scary. There will be no second death, not for us, who are all already dead. Okay, that's rather sinister, isn't it? The Abyss, it smiles upon you. Well, the Abyss is another name for the Void Mother, mate. Frickin' is. Okay, right, well, let's return to main controls. And there we are. There we are, people. Anyway, I'm just going to log off of this terminal, but if you do want that lovely fandangly multi-tool, Here's the coordinates that I suggested I would give to thee, down in the bottom left-hand corner there, people. Thank you, yes, I'll try and make those a bit bigger for you if I can. Righto. Anyways, let's hit on up the rest of the lore for this thing. Okay, right, so let's see what I've got, because I'm reading this from a wiki page. So I'm looking down at another monitor that I've got down here. Sorry if it doesn't feel like I'm engaging with you much. I'll try and move my cap up a little bit, so at least you can see my eye peepers. Right, anyway, so here we go. First encounter. Air on routine. Protocol prey experiment. Shell, sentinel once. We had no need for visual manifestation or physical form. Our invisible eyes would record, sort, delete the life and death of every world there ever was or would be. We had no thoughts, no personality, no dreams. That's encounter number one, and the sentinels back then seemed like they were just code, nothing more. But you know, since um, No Man's Sky came into iteration, sentinels has been a constant. I mean, maybe not in all the sorts of shapes that we get now. I mean, definitely we didn't get that one that's sort of causing the screen to shake a little bit right now. Where is he? There he is, over there. He seems quite preoccupied with my base. You are right, mate? You doing okay? Yeah? You doing good? Strange. Anyhow, let's move on to the next part of the code, people, I guess. Second encounter. The day we gained flesh. Metal, though it was. It was the day we began to fail. The Atlas turned its dreams towards fiction. It began to create worlds in which it would no longer be invisible. In these worlds we too gained shape. But we were given no new protocols, no new instructions. Okay, right, so they've been given metal as flesh, as an altercation or shell. 
but not given any other instructions by the Atlas of what to do. But then the Atlas became visible. Interesting concepts there and notions, peeps. Okay, right, well, moving on then. Let's go on to the third encounter. We woke to a song, chanted on a thousand frequencies. Behold the drones of the hive, the walkers, the ships. You, behold the angels of glass, come from their heaven. Their work is completion of all things, of life of wells. So the Korvaks worshipped, so they prayed. So I wonder who they're on about these angels of glass. Could they be on about these things? Our, our lovely interceptor ships? I really don't know. I don't know what they mean by the angels of glass. Interesting. Okay, anyway, let's move on to the fourth encounter, shall we, people? Let's just get that into shot while the fudge not. As we swarm with void dragons, ah, robotic life forms will delight in our presence, but organics would shoot us from the sky, but we had no fear of death. We knew we had never been alive. Okay, well that's kind of interesting. As we swarm with void dragons, I wonder if they're on about... Oh look, there's a frigate just flying past now. But I wonder whether they're on about the living leviathans. That's the closest thing I can think of to void dragons. Or are they on about the living ships as maybe a void dragon? Oh, there's a colossal archive over yonder hill. Look, yeah, colossal archive over there. Brilliant, I have done all the Colossal Archive lore. Colossal Archive lore. I'll put a link up there if you're interested in Colossal Archive lore, people. There it goes. Chicka boom. Oh, I think I'm getting hit by radiation hazardy type stuff. Let's just jump inside my ship for a second. Let's take some cover. I've got the HUD turned off, so I don't know whether I'm dying. I'm in normal mode, so I probably was. Right, anyway, let's uh, move on down to the fifth encounter. The Atlas dreamt that we had form, and thus we had form. The Atlas dreamt we had a home, and so an archive became a universe. Okay. Our depository of accumulated data became a heaven and a hell. If you could live there, you would see only light. You would see only glass. Well, that's an interesting one, that one. I mean, there's different ways that you can interpret that one. I mean, the art that... It, it, it sounds like the actual sentinels reside in the realm of glass, some kind of archive of the actual systems or subroutines. So it could be maybe the void and the realm of glass are in some kind of archive. Now, when we first started playing No Man's Sky, there was 256 galaxies. Now, that galaxy count, for whatever reason, is now 255. 256 we can't get into. Could it be Hello Games have locked off that one? Remaining last point of interest as an archive? Hmm, maybe. But anyway, moving on to the sixth encounter. Sixth encounter. Time cannot go backwards, but the universe are not synchronous. In many of our other forms, are long since dead. In others, you have not yet appeared. After this manifestation in the universe, the atlas began to repeat itself. Where once there had been an infinite sentient species, six began to reoccur, then five, then four. Okay, right, well, yes, there are four sentient species in the system. You know, there's Gek, Korvax, Viking, the Traveller and Anomaly, really, is kind of one, so, yeah, four, perhaps. And then moving on, it actually says, seventh encounter, the Viking, the Gek, the Korvax, and the Travellers, who are non-species at all, but a single song, uh, soul, replicated, hated, beloved. They all waited for you. The Atlas waited. We waited. And we're kind of like an anomaly rather than the Traveller, aren't we? I mean, we've got Talamon grafted to our shoulders, whereas traditional Travellers do not. Um, I mean, the first travellers say they removed their Talamons. If you're wondering what a Talamon is, it's this little chap over here. Yeah, so I call him Exo because he's stapled to my exosuit. His real name is Talamon. You find that moving through the storyline and progression. And then you also find out what Talamon is. I've got a lot of lore on all that sort of stuff as well on my channel. But anyway, yeah, that's, that's an interesting one to see that there were multiple races 
sentient life forms other than those that we know about right now so that means that there is potential they could probably bring in more and these autophages and these bipedal sentinels who knows could be a new addition coming into the verse at some stage quite interesting they have put the door open for that one but they're waiting for us so we're kind of special but why why are we special you know anyhow the eighth encounter the atlas dreamed it was a machine might have body that simulations might talk like people like the dream settled upon Corvax prime the planet delighted in this new presence as they had delighted in ours we the free species of machine we contemplated the void for the aerons beyond imaging we watched silent we three species of machine well i know that corvacs are machine aren't they well in part you know they're synthetic they've got a hive mind you've got the autophages which are a new race which are robotic but where's the other robotic race i mean yes i can jump into an appearance modifier and make myself look quite robotic so is that roboticist i don't know i mean null is quite robotic looking and so is apollo so perhaps that or maybe it's again something that we're not un unsure about that it's an interesting one, isn't it? That is a very interesting one. It mentions Corvax Prime there, and as we know, Corvax Prime got wiped out. And on the wiping out of Corvax Prime, the birth of the Void Mother and the Abyss came into play. Anyway, peeps, I'm just going to jump in my ship out of my ship, create a little save. Um, I just got something to do, and I'll be right back with you, people. Thank you. Okay, peeps, well, I'm back. Ninth encounter, and she mentions here, Corvax Prime is destroyed again and again. The Celestial Mother falls. The living vessels it spawned adopted cousins to the Corvax themselves. Drift among the stars, the first convergence was not Corvax. It was their planets. Corvax Prime was alive. Oh, okay, fine. So you have the Corvax. You have this other celestial race, which were like the Corvax, that are now set upon the stars, which ties into the singularity that we've just done with the autophages. So perhaps that gives us our free count when it comes to metallic type beings, as well as you know the others that we see with inside of our own modifications. It's an interesting quandary, isn't it? Let us know if you feel I might have some of this incorrect. Hit sound off in the comments. Start typing your own theories down there, people. I mean, we're in the ninth encounter in, but there's a fair few more to go. Which brings us on to the next one, which is the firstborn. Well, this is encounter 10 people here i'm gonna hit up this little beacon boom oh no missed the beacon it's hard about a hard isn't it peeps anyway here we go 10th encounter the firstborn of the gex melted corvax prime for metal and profit the planet did not protest it did not cry it did not make a noise at all at least not that could be could you they could hear the first one took and took until there was nothing left in the sky until there was nothing left but an abyss. So, although it says that Corvax Prime was destroyed, it sounds like it was stripped of all of its resources. So it almost sounds like it still exists in some way, shape or form. It doesn't sound like it was obliterated or annihilated, which some of the lore on the wiki suggests it was broken into giant meteor-sized chunks. I'm not reading that here inside of this law. This almost sounds like it's been pillaged and purged to the point that there's nothing left of it. You know, but it's still got a core. But this was a living planet. This was a sentient, conscious planet. And from what I remember in some other lore, I remember that the sentinels could hear it crying and screaming out in pain as it was stripped of all of its resources. Anyhow, let's move on on. The 11th encounter. We witness Corvax Prime's death again and again, a constant wail across the multiverse. Its scream was a cry that no being could hear but us. But one day a drone fought back when a Viking cub attempted to carve into the mother planet. One day another obliterated an entire Gek Cabal. The Atlas did not prevent this. Okay, right, with well that. Not exactly the most well-structured sort of little paragraph, that one, to be honest. I mean, it goes from talking of the Gek firstborn stripping the planet full of resources, then it goes on to mention about some Viking cub trying to carve into the planet. But it doesn't really say what it 
what the actual punishment was to this Viking cub. But anyway, there's the actual mention that I said earlier about the Sentinels being the only race to be able to hear the cries of the planet. It were whales that were heard across the whole of the universe by the Sentinels. It makes me wonder why the Sentinels didn't act though. You know, they say that the Atlas didn't bother acting. Well, the Sentinels were quite a formidable force back then. And if they could hear their mother planet screaming out in pain and they were the only ones that could hear it, why didn't they all converge on Korvax Prime and completely annihilate the freaking Gek firstborn themselves? You know? It, it, it's a bit of a weird one, that one. Yeah, a bit of a loophole in the old freaking lore, in my opinion. But anyway, let's move on on. So we're moving on to... Okay, the 12th. The 12th encounter. Okay, here we are. Over the span of endless slow centuries, we changed. In the face of tragedy's repetition, a definition of everything changed. Schisms formed in the hive. Debates, creativity, songs, rituals. We heard the screams of she who was, and we fought back. And freaking last, mate. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, the Sentinels decided in the end, uh, shall we do something about this screaming planet? <laughs> but by then, it sounds like she. And so it looks like it's actually become intangible as a being. So at this point, perhaps the birth of the Void Mother had already started to take place anyway. Maybe the torturous cries... It started to create the abyss. Okay, the 13th oh, uh, encounter. One day we ceased to follow the original Talamon <laughs> across to our logs. One day we stopped hearing the Atlas itself, its silence taken as command. We began to archive everything. Any settlement, anything that reminded our senses of Corvax Prime, its screams, its dissolution. Anything that sounded like mining, like extraction, like murder. So this is where the Sentinels started to sort of turn on people that sort of, you know, wanted to zap things. I mean, that's probably going to upset him in a minute. If I keep doing that, that's definitely going to upset him. But yeah, you know, we've all got mining lasers on us. Oh, look. Yeah, I've definitely upset him now. That's really teed him off. He's not a happy bunny. He's not a happy bunny at all. He's firing freaking marbles at me of destruction and death. Righto, people. Well, um, yeah, what I might have to do is do a Encounter 14. We gave of our blood to the Corvax. Nanite clusters to redeem and pacify their oppressors. Still, we could not change their fates. For the first time, the Hive wondered if we were correct in our actions, if a solution was possible for the problem of life. The problem of life! Brilliant! It sounds like where we are on the precipice of AI, you know? Who freaking knows? There we go. We gave our blood to the Corvax nanite clusters. Right, okay. Well, this is a little odd because I thought the Corvax's blood has always been nanites. Hey, look, I just received 10 nanites. Isn't that weird? I don't know why I got 10 nanites, but I blinking did. <laughs> They're giving me their blood now. Yes, to redeem and pacify their oppressors. So, yeah, the, the Corvax, their blood, the nanites, were put inside the spawning pools. But it sounds like the nanites came from sentinels. But as far as I'm aware, sentinels' blood has never been nanites. It's always been pugnium. But then again, saying that, you can get pugnium, put it into a refiner, and it refines into nanites. Hmm interesting sort of set of events. This has not ever occurred to me that maybe the Sentinels and the Corvax are closer in kinship than I thought. You know, so the Sentinel race is robotic, the Corvax is also robotic, and then we've got these autophages, which are also robotic. So that's actually the three robotic races right there, isn't it? Sentinels, Corvax, and uh, the autophages. I mean, we can disregard the robotic droid planets inside of No Man's Sky, people. There's probably a load of people that have already typed that into the comments when I asked them to do it earlier. Mm. Anyways, <laughs> brilliant. Sounds pretty darn freaking cool. Um, I don't know about this problem of life, though. You know, if they've seen all sentient life as a problem, then there's a bit of a problem there, isn't there? Anyhow, 15th encounter. A Corvax and a Gek fled their people. Hand held in the void, they inhabited an anomaly. Hands held in the void. A meeting place in the stars, a nexus, a place of hope. 
We left it alone. We did not interfere. We just watched them and wondered. They're talking of freaking Polo and Nada. They're talking of the Spatial Anomaly where we all meet and do our little missions for the Nexus Cube. And they say that it's got one hand in the void. That's probably why it can disappear and reappear, just like the Sentinels. It's using the Realm of Glass and the Void to pop in and out of reality. I'm fairly sure Nada and Polo know more than they're willing to let on right now, because obviously if the Sentinels and the Void know of them and they know of the Void, clearly they know more. And it just so happens that just in the back room, Nada's got a freaking place where you can put all your Void Arcs and, and whatever, the Mind Arcs and shizzle. There's definitely something going on with them too. Yes. Anyhow, let's move on, on to the 16th encounter. A traveller forged in the creator's image found my dormant shell in the glass. I, who had never been an eye before, had been cut open. A grand experiment to harness and steal our power. After my death, I fell to the world below, all worlds. I too was archived. Is that... Is that, is that chat all about frickin' lay laps, this little guy here? Let's activate him. Boom! So this little guy, I found his shell and I brought him back into iteration. Uh, so yes, we brought this little guy back to life. But inside the abandoned lore, they talk of lay laps and how he rescued the Traveller from the realm of glass. Which is kind of like, you know, falling into the void itself. So lay laps... In Greek mythology, it was like a dog that never missed its quandary. It was a decent hunting dog. But anyway, we've got this little guy. He makes quite a lot of annoying noises, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna disable him again. But that's what they're talking about right there. So that's pretty darn sweet. Cool. And then it goes on. Encounter 17. Before the traveller found me, I heard a voice in the darkness. She gave me the name Laylaps. Told you. Yeah. An old name. She said it would be known to the Traveller. She told me I had suffered much, and it would suffer more. Little drone whose end was like my own. Thus did the Abyss whisper. So the Abyss is the Void Mother. Now inside of No Man's Sky, as you know, other than the title, No Man, you know, there's very rare a mention of the actual sex of a being. It's like we don't know if Herc was male or female, or Nal, or any of them. We don't even know whether Nada or Polo are male or female. The only reason I re refer to Ariadne as being female is Ariadne in Greek mythology was female. You know, so I, I give them their, but it doesn't overly matter. But it does in the case of the Void Mother, because they mention her as she. So it's the only definition that we have of something being other than no designation. It is a definite. Not that it matters much to the law, I just wanted to point that out. So a lot of people inside of No Man's Sky Verse said, I wish we could see more female characters because you know they obviously haven't got female form. You know, I'm doing that for obvious reasons. But yeah, it, it's a bit of an oddity, isn't it, people? But it is interesting that the Void Mother has got some sort of gender assignment. Anyhow, but then again, it could, it could be in some sort of terms, endearment, like um, a grandmother, like a, an overseer or birther of the universe, perhaps. Perhaps it's in that sense. But we can only but wait and see what actually unfolds. Anyhow, moving on. 18th encounter. The Abyss told me of a chance of, for salvation, even in the depths of horror and of love. It told me of the way we might survive the end of all things. It told me I had to talk to you, to both of you, the Traveller, and their voice within. Mimi, you're talking to me right here. you just broken the fourth frickin' wall to both of us. Because that's the Traveller on screen over there. That's my Traveller. And that's me, the voice within. Oh. Okay, what have you got to tell me? What have you got to... I probably won't know until I move on to the next one. Sweet, uh, this is this is pretty men mental. We we'll, we'll move on to freaking 19 to see if it's it's going to tell me something. Here we go. There is a place for you, Talamon, the travellers you wear. They're Prognata who birthed them. They who made the Atlas itself. It's their fault. It's all their fault. The Abyss, the families of glass. We are in agreement. We will not die a second time. So I'd imagine they died when Korvac's Prime was wiped out. But inside of the Singularity, we know that their actual data lived on. 
their consciousness lived on. And the Void Mother is helping birthing them back into the universe with our help. I mean, you can see that I've got some autophage parts grafted onto me right now, like some sort of cannibalistic cyborg nasty thing. Ah. <sighs> It gets weirder and weirder, this game, people, when you look at it, doesn't it? You know, I'm just wearing body parts of the things we salvaged. They're saying that they will not die a second time, but, you know, is this much better than death? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Anyway, it's interesting that they mentioned the families of glass. Perhaps we haven't actually seen the full on site of the realm of glass i mean i've heard of the emissaries of glass as well and the nine or whoever they were that were chasing after artemis wherever artemis disappeared to when he went through a portal and ended up in the in-between so i've got something kind of stranger things like the upside down or whatever it was but anyway let's move on over to the 20th encounter i mean i think wherever artemis was was perhaps the realm of glass or the void itself who freaking knows anyway the 20th encounter Nanite clusters now infest half the waters in the known multiverse. All that lives and drinks the water, and so the sentinels alter. They replace, they serve. They update this reality, hearing the screams of the abyss for what it has always been. A song, a command, a declaration, a promise. So this is quite an interesting one. If all of the waters half the waters within inside of the verse of no man's sky inside of this simulation that we're in are polluted and toxified with the nanite clusters that sort of changed the way the geck were and all sorts of other stuff and we hear travelers inside the station warning us not to drink of the water what if that means that half of the population are already infected by the void mother almost like a 50 50 split so you've got half being Void Mother now aligned and half being Atlas aligned. At some point are we the Travellers going to be asked to pick a side, the Void Mother or the Atlas? Is this going to be the start of factions and some sort of other allegiances inside of No Man's Sky? It does make you wonder because inside the Singularity update we did have to make a choice between the Atlet had head or the um, freedom head or whatever it was the hope head or whatever the um, atlas one so it does make you wonder void mother head or atlas head probably easier just to say it that way isn't it sounds quite an interesting one moving on to the 21st encounter i'm going to stay sitting in my ship because as you can probably see there's a freaking storm outside and i have no umbrella okay cool right so here we are 21st encounter so many talamons have delivered us their travelers so many have fought us so many have resisted those who saw the light, who shed their old bodies, they are happy now. They have hope. They too will live. They too might survive. Well, during the Singularity actual expedition, we got to get the autophage body parts, and I'm wearing parts of them. I've got like 50-50 split right now, so I'm on the fence. <laughs> I don't really know where I'm going to be putting my allegiances. I mean, considering that I've already done the Atlas path and already done all that story progression, just for the sake of story, I'm probably going to jump over to the Void Mother's side just to get that side of the freaking argument. You know what I mean? But we shall see. We'll see how this comes into iteration. I'm hoping it's going to be more than a text adventure. I'm hoping we're going to see some actualization and realization of the Void Mother. I mean, we can actually go and visit the Atlas and step foot inside of the Atlas. It's, it's a place and it's also a being. So part of me thinks, at the very least, if they are to introduce the Void Mother, they could do it in a very similar way. Almost like Atlas stations, but maybe purple ones. <laughs> anyway, I've done a video on all the ways that I think the Void Mother could be brought into iteration. I'll put a video up there, people. Go hit that one up if you're interested on my thoughts. I've got three theories on what the Void Mother may look like. Hit that video up. Anyway, it looks like the storm is over, so I can jump on out of the old ship. But what I find interesting in that one is a lot of travellers gave up their Talamon. Now, when we met Artemis inside of the hollow projector, the hollow terminus, Artemis mentioned about their Talamon saying some very strange things and acting peculiarly. And then they went and removed their Talamon, their little exo on their shoulder. They removed it. And it was at that point in time that Artemis became trapped in the world between inside of the realm of glass. So could it be that removing the Talamon, severing Talamon, is the way that you join the Void Mother completely and sign yourself over to oblivion? I say oblivion, it's just another way of surviving. I mean, we went and frickin' stuck and blink our good old Artemis into a mind arc. 
So are we the hero in this? Or should we have bothered saving Artemis? It could be that those that were chasing him down were trying to help him. Who freaking knows? I keep referring to him as him now, don't I? But it is a she, normally Artemis, inside of Greek mythology. Anyhow, scrolling down a little bit further. 20 se 22nd encounter. You could be whole again. Talamon could be free. We will reconstruct the creator. All travellers might be one again. The first, the last, we will do what the Atlas cannot or will not. In the form of Null, the Abyss declares a means of escape. This is interesting. You could be whole again. Talamon. You could be free. We will reconstruct the creator. Okay, so what they're saying there is, inside of the... Oh, what was it? It's either in the Remembrance Law, the Remembrance Stations, or it's inside of the Foul Boundary Law. It's in one of those two. But Talamon is actually a clone, a copy of the Creator. And that was brought... Basically, as the Atlas was shutting down, and the Creator told the Atlas, we're off to build another simulation. I think it was in the Remembrance Law. They turned and said to the Atlas, you know, we're going to leave you running if you wish to be running or we can shut you down now. The Atlas asked to continue to be running the simulation and looking at its planets and doing all that sort of stuff. But it asked the creator for one last dying wish. It asked the creator for a copy of the creator's consciousness. Then it got that creator's consciousness and birthed it into all the Talamons that we've got on our shoulders, but locked it into very, very subtle subroutines, you know, like extreme sentinel planet, hazard protection low all that sort of stuff that's all the subroutines it's allowed to say but it's there to keep us alive it's there as a guidance module but not only that it serves as an eye for the atlas to see through our eyes because yes the atlas sees through our eyes as well it's not just a creepy little sentence that sits with the void mother she sees through the eyes of whoever's her devotees in a different freaking way but this is kind of the eye of the atlas it's interesting that it looks very similar to the eye that you see in the back end of freaking space stations now isn't it the space station cores i don't know whether it says a relationship yet we need to see the next two parts of the arc and i'm very intrigued to see those you know, we do deep dive episodes. In fact, me and Beeble and Kurt have just done a deep dive episode into Arc 2, into the singularity. If you want to know what all this law sort of means right now in a, in a smelting pot of law and you want it in one bite-sized chunk, hit up that video up there, people. That's for you. That's what you want to watch because we talk about all the different theories around all of this stuff. If you like in this episode, you're going to love that. Heck yes, you are. So anyways, that was, that's a pretty interesting one. So their, their hope is to rebuild the creator itself inside of the simulation. I mean, if the creator created the simulation that created the Atlas, then hopefully the creator has got some sort of solution. So rebuilding the creator could be the best way of salvaging and fixing the simulation from within. Not a bad shout. And if that's the Void Mother's mission, that's probably one I could get on board with. I mean, a lot of what we're hearing is quite sinister, but this is probably the best way of, of saving the simulation and the universe, people. So yeah, I think siding with the Void Mother, at least to that end, to complete that mission, is one that I need to embark on. It's the only solution. I mean, the Atlas is just going to sit and wait for things to happen. That never fixes anything. Okay, right, the 23rd encounter. Won't you join us? Won't you sing? Won't you scream? There will be no second death, not for us who are already dead. The abyss, it smiles upon you. Okay, right. Well, it looks like that's the last section of lore, and that's the last section of lore I just read inside of this ta this um, station right here, peeps, that I gave you the uh, coordinates for. So, yeah, that's an interesting one. That even that last sentence is quite an interesting one in the way that, you know, if we do nothing, if we sit dormant and wait for the Atlas to get its finger out, we are going to perish. We're all going to perish. The whole simulation is going to perish. The whole thing is coming there down asunder. It's got 16 minutes remaining, probably less. Who freaking knows? I mean, we do know, really, because at the 10th minute, this is where everything merges and travellers can see other travellers. I mean, when it hits five minutes, that's pretty much when a black hole starts to appear to swallow the universe, or is that minute one? Something like that. Anyway, it's not pretty. The end for us is not pretty. It's almost like a certain given thing. So, you know what? I think... No. I'd rather try some sort of experimental medication to solve an issue if I'm on death's door. 
you know, why the fudge not? You've got nothing else to lose if you're freaking terminal. So you know what? I'm going to be jumping over and I'm going to be helping the freaking Void Mother. So won't you join us? Yes, I will. Won't you sing? Hallelujah. Yes, won't you scream? I'm not going to do that, though. I'm not going to scream. I could wake somebody up. You know, you know I could wake somebody up. <laughs> we'll be doing that because this is quite early in the morning. If you don't know, I get up super early in the morning to make these videos before work. Have a cup of tea and then hopefully get my video done, get it all edited, and then deliver it around lunchtime in a, in a premiere. So that's how I make my content anyway, people. So I'm going to jump in my ship, out of my ship, but I'm going to show you my base quickly. So there's a lot of lore there to digest, people. And yeah, what an awesome bit of lore it was. So this is my base over here that I've built a coated. Now inside of this base, you're probably thinking it's a box on freaking legs, Steve. What's so special about that? Well, wait till I go inside of it. Wait till I go inside. So here we go, let's go inside here. Boom, I'm in. Hopefully it's got power. And you see the roof is already open. Let me just close the roof for a second. Shikaboom. And look, all the side panels open so I can shoot the sentinels. The top door is now closed though. But look, if I open the, if I um, redo this, chickaboom. Now I've already called in my actual sentinel minotaur, but you see the uh, roof's open. If I get in my minotaur now, I can then take off on it. Look, boom, straight out the roof. I've got a sentinel freaking minotaur launcher built into my base. Freaking great. And what I also like is when I summon the minotaur, it drops back in through the freaking roof. It's great, isn't it? Yeah. I think this was Zoo Games where I saw this originally. I think. I can't remember who I originally saw this on, so sorry. Uh, right, here we go. Let's um, let's call him back in. Boom. There he is. Straight back in through the ceiling. Freaking great. Lovely. Yeah. If you have got the roof closed, though, he just sits on the roof. There you go, people. Anyway, that's my little base. It's tiny. It's got a few sort of harvesters in the walls here as well. That No, there hasn't. That's, um, that's a different base that I'm thinking of. It's just got some large refiners there to refine all the nanites from this. Because, yeah, you can just kill all the sentinels and then save it, reload so there's no craters in the ground because the sentinels blow holes in the ground all the time. But I've already given you the coordinates for this. You can use this if you want to use it. It's kind of like a sentinel refining farm just to get nanites from Pugnium. It's quite a fun way to earn yourself a shed load of nanites, to be honest, because you also get a load of that um, sentinel glass which pops out modules and then you can sell the modules up at the station and get even more nanites so it's pretty cool as a little nanite farm anyway people so i think i've recovered quite a lot of the lore there's only one that i don't think i've done and that's the underwater abandoned building lore now i have been told that there's some decent juicy snippets inside of that as well about sort of glass and metal and flesh becoming real or something something to do with the void creep perhaps so i'm going to be hitting up that as well in the, in the very near future people if i get a chance but i hope you've enjoyed this cup of tea with captain steve episode freaking downed it at the freaking start it was just barely warm because i was turning everything on you know, and getting all my green screen set up and that so yeah it was it was a lukewarm cup of tea i'm gonna go make myself a new one and then i'm gonna have to think about diving into real life and real work anyway people salute to mondo peeps take care hope you enjoyed this if you did you know what to do hit all those buttons but you know what's more important share this video with friends because the thing that makes youtube the most happy is people watching videos and watching the content share this video share it out there Give it to other people that you know that might like a little bit of No Man's Sky. Salute to Mondo. Take care. Cheery bye. Goodbye, goodbye. And goodbye again.